Hey folks, it's time to cover the lecture content uh, in module three. So let's talk about the birth of an empire, that empire being Empire Strikes Back. So the second that it was determined that Star Wars was a hit, Star Wars II became a necessity. In the 1970s was the era of the first blockbusters, of which Star Wars was exactly the second. The first one I'll uh, force you to do research to figure out what that was. And blockbusters, of course, ushered in the era of sequels. But before the sequel could arrive, a whole lot of important things happened that expanded the Star Wars universe and consolidated its hold on the American imagination and pocketbook. So we have books and comics. Um, so even before the first movie made it to theaters, the novelization by Alan Dean Foster, the actual writer of it, even though it says George Lucas on the cover, um, and the first three comic issues of a six issue set by Marvel's Roy Thomas were already on the shelves. Uh, then came Splinter of the Mind's Eye in 1978, which was also by Foster, which functioned as a sort of substitute sequel to Star Wars while fans are waiting uh, for 1980 to roll around. And Splinter is crediting with kicking off the EU or Extended Universe, which created such a briar patch of narrative possibilities, around 400 books and comics and other pieces of media, that Disney had to prune it back by selectively reestablishing canon when it purchased Lucasfilm. A whole big mess, but I mean, there's a whole the whole lot of stuff in the Extended Universe, and uh, there's some opportunities to explore that further. Next, we have Toys. Um, the goal is to have the first action figures available in time for Christmas of 77, but George kind of underestimated how long it might take a toy company to create Luke Skywalker and C-3PO figures from scratch. So an early bird certificate package was rolled out just before Christmas, promising its purchasers their action figures sometime in early 1978. And this ploy actually worked. Giving kids a piece of cardboard for Christmas, promising them something later, that actually worked. Um, Kenner would go on to make over 100 different action figures and spaceships and dioramas and creatures, etc. Um, until the late 80s, mid to late 80s. Uh, the Boba Fett action figure was the first Empire Strikes character to be offered in the lead up to the sequel's release because uh, he was also in the Star Wars Christmas special, which we'll unfortunately talk about more. There were also board games, plush animals, every other manner of toy available during the first Star Wars era, 1977 to 1984. And some have claimed that it was the toy sales that really gave George Lucas the creative and financial freedom to make the first two sequels the way that he wanted, in addition to determining which characters and spaceships were featured in those films. So the toys were incredibly uh, important in all of this. And I was a kid when this all happened, so it was incredibly important to me because I was a kid. Uh, TV appearances. So before a Muppet appeared in The Empire Strikes Back, the cast of Star Wars appeared on The Muppet Show, uh, episode 417 in 1980. And seemingly this was meant to promote the upcoming film to a young, vulnerable audience that would allow that would follow Luke Skywalker off a high cliff if necessary. Uh, but prior to this uh, was a much more infamous Star Wars TV appearance, the Star Wars Christmas special uh, from 1978. It was seen by few, hated by all, especially George Lucas. Um, it was a shameless attempt to cash in on the Star Wars phenomenon. Um, horribly conceived and abominably executed, it serves as a grave reminder of how truly wrong things can go, even for a relatively bulletproof franchise. Uh, even more so than Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. That's hard to believe, but it's, it's true. And I'm providing you a link to this somewhere. I don't remember where. Probably with uh, The Empire Strikes Back. Hopefully it's, it's still there because, you know, they take it down whenever they can off of YouTube because it's just so embarrassing. Um, and then we have movies. So even though Star Wars wasn't actually science fiction, um, which I will, I tell people in my science fiction class, but also I'm telling you folks again, I tried to establish it in the, la in the prior modules. Um, it still ushered in a wave of sci-fi films over the next three to five years. Um, and some were great, um, like Alien. Um, which, you know, was its own franchise. Others were not great, like Battle Beyond the Stars and uh, Disney's Black Hole. Um, actual adaptations of Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers even reached the big screen um, soon after, 1980 and 1979, respectively. Um, and they were about as far from Star Wars in quality and gravitas as you can get while still retaining their own kitschy charm. Especially when I was a kid, I loved Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Uh, TV series, not so much, but the movie I thought was great. Um, Flash Gordon, it took me a few years to really, really appreciate that. 
Um, eventually, Hollywood figured out that Star Wars was not a phenomenon that was easily copied. It was lightning in a bottle, and only George Lucas and a select few knew how to brew it up again. So brewing that lightning um, required writing, though, which, happened, which needed to happen quickly. Um, so in order to expedite the writing process and to allow him to focus on the brainstorming part, um, George Lucas brought in the veteran sci-fi fantasy author Lee Brackett uh, to pen the script. Unfortunately, Brackett um, took Lucas's notes and ran in a direction he didn't like. And then, to add insult to injury, sort of, um, she actually died. But she died before he was able to tell her that he didn't like her work and was going to go in a different direction. So I guess nobody really got insulted. She didn't want to tell him as she was writing it that she was actually in very poor health. Um, so then he wrote a new draft himself. And he handed it off to Lawrence Kasdan, um, with whom he was already working on Raiders of the Lost Ark. They had a rapport. He liked Lawrence Kasdan's work, which is good because Lawrence Kasdan is a good writer. Um, and they also hired Irvin Kirshner, um, who was a mentor of his from uh, USC, uh, to direct. And that resulted in some excellent performances in Empire Strikes Back and a painstaking attention to detail which is missing from some of the other movies, but it also led to problematic budget overruns and the dismissal of producer Gary Kurtz, who'd been part of the Star Wars posse um, since the very beginning. Um, and all these things aside, The Empire Strikes Back eventually emerged in 1980 um, and sold more tickets than its predecessor, and it also set up the wait for the third and final sequel. Uh, and all this is from How Star Wars Conquered the Universe, pages 232 to 245. So the notes for the specific movie, I found every poster I could. I particularly like the uh, Polish one with Yoda on it right there. So as I mentioned before, uh, Empire Strikes Back was directed by Irvin Kirshner, who also did a film in the late 60s called The Fine Madness um, with Sean Connery in it. Um, decent movie, actually. Um, written by Lee Braggett, even though none of her original material really exists in the final script, but they thought kind of in memoriam they should give her a credit anyway. Um, Lawrence Kasdan and, of course, George Lucas came up with the story to begin with. Now, the budget was $33 million. The original budget was $18 million, which is the main reason why Gary Kurtz was fired. Um, the time was a big thing, too. Um, George Lucas really wanted to be independent of the studio and having to ask for more money to finish the movie really, really bothered him. So that's why Gary Kurtz had to go. But the good news is that Gary Kurtz got to go work on The Dark Crystal, which was totally awesome. The box office, $209 million in the initial release, $550 million all subsequent releases included, probably adjusted for inflation, but maybe not. Hopefully it all matches up. Um, was generally considered to be the best of the Star Wars films by Gen Xers, like myself in particular, um, benefiting from more confident writing um, and direction um, than its pre predecessor. Uh, its plot twist, which is really entirely predictable, um, you know, caused the Earth's crust to move slightly, and its open ending was considered controversial at the time, but was incredibly effective for kids in 1980. Um, when I was like eight years old and I'm watching this movie and it ends and it's like, what? That's it? But then it just made me want to go out and buy all the toys and have my own adventures. So it worked that way. Okay. Um, synopsis, uh, still seething after the, the destruction of the Death Star, the Empire confronts and scatters the Rebel Alliance from its ice planet hideout. Luke attempts to continue his Jedi training with the new master while Han, Leia, and the rest try to enlist the help of new allies. I'm trying not to put any spoilers in there. Um, so Luke's face slashing by the Wampa at the beginning of the film may have been an unconscious decision by either George Lucas or Larry Kasdan uh, in the script to cover up the effects of Mark Hamill's car accident in 1977. He had a broken nose, a cheekbone, his face you know, went through the windshield, which is kind of what happens if you survive. Um, and so if it was intentional, uh, no one will admit to having the whole Wampa scene and his face getting scratched. But in my opinion, it was a really brilliant if kind of a cynical move. Um, it definitely prepared children to see, you know, their hero's face looking a little bit differently. There was like, it was a totally seamless transition as far as I was concerned. Um, Harrison's, Harrison Ford's reluctance to appear in a third movie um, necessitated Han Solo's being put on ice, literally. So since Harrison Ford never agreed to do the next film, um, 
he got, kind of consistently did that. And he always wanted to get killed off in the movies, too. Um, they decided if they put him on ice, they might not have to defrost him in the next movie if he decided not to. So that was kind of a brilliant move, too. Uh, Sir Alec Guinness had to be asked very nicely to appear as a force ghost in this, uh, since he was still miffed at being killed off in the first film. Um, and he was generally known to be a bit of a curmudgeon. If you ever read any of the transcripts of the interviews he read about Star Wars, he rarely had a good thing to say um, about anybody. And then David Prowse, uh, the actor in the Darth Vader suit, um, he had to be kept away from the press and anyone else with a camera or a microphone because he kept spilling the beans about Vader being Luke's father, um, which he did as early as like late 1977. Um, even though he most likely didn't have advanced knowledge of this being in the story because of the fact that um, nobody trusted him with information because they were afraid he'd spill the beans. So very, they always had a problematic relationship with... Um, with the man in the suit.